Good morning. We are here with uh, Dave Rendell, who's the author of the book, uh, The Freak Factor. He's just come out from a wonderful session and presentation at the American University of Dubai, and we're privileged to, to have him here. So we get a few minutes with Dave talking about what is the freak factor? Can you explain it in, in, in brief terms? Yeah, the simplest explanation that I use is I spent my whole life getting in trouble because I couldn't sit still, be quiet, and do what I was told. Now I get paid to stand up and talk and run my own business. So I realized, I think much too late, unfortunately, um, or I wish I would have learned it sooner, that my biggest weaknesses were also strengths. The things that people were trying to stop me from doing were the very things that I should be using to be successful and I started wondering is that true for other people and I started finding examples and stories of it sort of happening everywhere I developed an assessment to show people the connection between their strengths and weaknesses wrote the book and now I travel around the world sharing that story because it's done so much for me um, I know it has the potential to do so much for other people in this part of the world the word failure uh, is a huge stigma yeah. and we just don't know how to handle it we just don't know how to deal with it yeah how can you advise us in terms of failure and, and, and discovering ourselves in that process. I think there's two parts of that. One is, is failing on purpose at things that oftentimes other people have set have, as goals for us. You shared a little bit of that with, with your story earlier, that somebody says, I want you to be a, an accountant or a doctor, and you decide, I'm going to fail in their eyes because that's not who I am, right? Those aren't my strengths. So I think that's one way to look at failure. Um, another way to look at failure is, is to recognize that sometimes failure um, is teaching us a lesson. And it, it isn't the lesson people think the most often. We've heard, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Sometimes failure is telling us this isn't our thing. This isn't the area where we're going to be successful. You talked about how you did on the exams. It wasn't a, I guess I should double down and try harder. It was, I guess I need to move in a different direction because this isn't me. So I think that's a lesson we can learn from failure as well, that failure doesn't mean we're a terrible person. Failure doesn't mean we're worthless. Failure is oftentimes just a lesson guiding us down a path and showing us that the path we were on, at least right now, wasn't quite right, and, and sometimes we need to move in a different direction. What is the secret sauce that a young company, uh, an entrepreneur, needs to be able to get from this side of the river to that side yeah. of the river? How do you bridge that? Refusing to follow the crowd. I think the biggest temptation, especially early on, especially when you're trying to get started, is what are they doing? What are they doing? What are they doing? If we were just a little bit bigger and if we just had been around a little bit longer and if we just had a little bit more money and if we just... And, and so we start to copy and we start to follow and we start to think that someone else already has this figured out and we stop doing the things that would truly make us different and we stop looking for opportunities to really stand out from everyone else and we start to try to take the easy road or start to follow other people's blueprint and that, but they don't have a blueprint they don't know and and sometimes their path isn't isn't going to be your path so i think the secret sauce is that recognizing there is a secret sauce and it is a secret and you can't just get it from somebody else uh, you have to sort of find it you have to discover it you have to seek it out and you have to be relentless with that um, but you can't expect that doing things the way other people have done is going to get you to where you need to go um, and that there is a unique path for you and that's precisely what's going to make your business the most valuable. The more original it is, the more valuable it's going to be. The more you start of, you get there by copying other people, the more than other people can just copy you and then you've lost your advantage. Well, I think too often we've sort of been taught in life that we shouldn't be telling our story, that, um, that our story isn't really our story. It's us walking through the pages of a story that our parents are trying to write for us, that our company is trying to write for us, that our society is trying to write for us. So I think the first thing for people to get comfortable with is that we have a story and that that is a story worth telling and that that story might benefit other people and that there, as you said earlier, there's highs and lows to that story. There's failures in that story. But those, story, those failures are not only helpful to us, if we share those, it can be phenomenally helpful to other people and that oftentimes the way we build rapport between us and other people is to admit our vulnerabilities, is to admit our weaknesses. I think the story that a lot of entrepreneurs try to tell is oftentimes, look what I succeeded at, here's how I did it, if you do things the same way you'll end up at the same point. Instead of saying, here's all the mistakes I made, here's all the failures I had, here's all the ways in which I'm not the perfect person for doing this and here's how I resolved those issues. Here's some of the, the pain that I've experienced. Here's some of the difficulties that I've had. That really draws people in. People want to hear those kinds of stories, but we, we oftentimes tell stories where we're the hero and we always win and we never lose and we always come out on top and no one wants to hear those stories. Uh, people learn from stories in which there's challenge and there's overcoming and there's difficulty. 
And authenticity. Yeah, well, and that's the authenticity to be able to say vulnerability and weakness and those kinds of things. Instead of thinking, sanitizing the story and making it just a success story. We think those are the stories people want to hear, but that's oftentimes not the whole story. So I think that would be part of it, the authenticity to tell the whole story. And, and that's one thing I've gotten really comfortable with. Most of my jokes, most of my stories, most of the things that people laugh at are actually things that are wrong with me. My arm doesn't work. It's been damaged in multiple ways. And I tell these stories and people laugh, but they also say, you know what? I'm not perfect either. And yeah. Dave's not perfect. And he's not up there trying to sell me perfection. I have weaknesses. Dave has weaknesses. He's someone I can believe in. This is a story that might apply to me. Uh, I tell the whole story now, whereas Initially, that's not sort of your tendency. That's not, that's not the natural way to go about things. We're going through unprecedented change. Uh, the world is getting really small and, and, and extremely well connected. So one of the phrases that I use uh, when I'm presenting is that we need to change the way we think about change. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Is that the right way to, to think that we have to now look at a different way in, yeah. in, in terms of reviewing change? Yeah, I think one of the ways we look at change wrong is that we say... Um, I can't wait till things get back to normal. Yeah. Or when this is over, I hope things settle down for a little while. I think one of the things that we have to see is that change is constant. It's a mistake to think that change has somehow ever slowed down or stopped or something like that, or that it will again. Right? So I think one of the ways we need to change and one of the ways we look at it wrong is we need to realize change is constant. A change isn't optional. It's inevitable. It's going to keep coming. It's going to keep happening. It's going to keep going faster and faster and faster. And so life isn't really about adapting to change. Life is about recognizing that it's always changing and starting to look at I think the other mistake we make as it relates to change is thinking life's about responding to change. I think at some point our goal should be the one making the change. I'm the one initiating the change. I'm the one pushing the change. Instead of sort of grudgingly accepting it once it comes, what if I was the person that was driving it? What if I was the person that was forcing it? What if other people had to change because of what I was doing in my business, in my industry, instead of me being the one who has to change for them? You're advising a lot of entrepreneurs and you're, you're presenting uh, in those environments. Yeah. Disruption must be a word that you uh, yeah. will be encountering yeah. regularly. Yeah. Um, what is your advice on disrupting ourselves at yeah. a developed stage in our lives? You yeah. said you discovered your, um, your strengths or your, you know, uh, in your 30s. Yeah. A lot of people I find exactly the same. How do you disrupt yourself? Well, I think we disrupt ourselves by asking some difficult questions sometimes. I mean, somebody in the presentation today asked, what if you're a lion that's been in the circus so long you've forgotten what a lion really is, right? And a lion is your mascot, your logo, right? Um, and so I think it's starting to recapture that, starting to remember the things that we did as children that energized us as children that we couldn't stop doing as children. And, and looking at where those remnants still are, where those, those whispers still are, and starting to give ourselves permission to do those things again. Um, and, and, and to challenge some of the assumptions that we've made and some of the assumptions that we hear from the people around us. And so I think that's where the disruption comes from is saying, I think one, one simple question we could start asking to disrupt ourselves is, is this really true? Are the things I've been taught true? Is this right? Is this really working? And I think one way to do that for me, I'm a huge learner. I love to read. I love uh, what you're doing. I love to watch videos. I, I love to um, take in as much new information as possible. One way to disrupt yourself is to read things deliberately that, that challenge the way you've thought about things. Read stories of people who've been successful in the ways that you want to be successful, or maybe even in different ways, and really listen to the story and see are they on a different path? Are they doing different things? And are you ready to, to learn those lessons or are you just kind of blindly moving in your direction? In your travels, you've been all over the world, six continents, as you said, excluding the penguins, of course, yes, right. <laughs> in the Antarctica. What are the common leadership traits, the common things that you find across the world? I dare say it's fairly consistent, is it not? I think the one thing I find is that it's not consistent, right? That it's consistently not consistent, right? That, 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 that some people would say, for example, you've got to lead with passion and energy. Uh, but then I just worked with a CEO in Pakistan who is incredibly calm and steady, right? And that has its own strength to it, right? And some people will say, I'm so analytical and that's what makes me a good leader. And somebody else, though, they do it all on intuitive feel, right? So I think what I find is that there's a lot of ways to get to the same 
point. And I think there are some things that are sort of fundamental to leadership. But I think sometimes we see someone succeed in leadership in a certain area in a certain way, and we think, okay, that's the way to do it. But oftentimes there's another way to end up at that same point and, and doing it differently. But I do think there are a few things. There has to be, there has to be vision and direction. There has to be inspiration. Um, we do have to be able to influence other people. Um, and in order to do that, one of the best ways is by, by influencing ourselves, by managing ourselves. And I think ultimately the best leaders are people who um, are always looking to bring out the best in other people and in themselves. If I'm not improving, how can I expect you to improve? If I'm not moving forward, how can I expect you to move forward? And I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make, um, and I see this the world over, and this is the most common, um, is a lack of integrity. People think somehow I can get by by faking it, by cheating, by lying, by stealing. That always catches up. It's sort of like a, a snowball that keeps melting yeah. as opposed to a snowball that's rolling downhill and keeps growing. Um, and so I think there's definitely some things that, that always catch up to people and always cause them to fail. And there's some things that are always required regardless of where you are. But I think there's also a lot more variability than we oftentimes recognize. And so we too often, like I said earlier, jump on someone else's model and think, I have to be more like that if I'm going to succeed. Let's put you in a little spaceship and, and transport you into the future. Um, I hope it's a big spaceship because I don't fit very well on. <laughs> I know. Uh, and uh, imagine it's your 100th birthday. Um, what are we celebrating? What will yeah. your legacy be at that point yeah. in time? Um, one of the coolest responses I've gotten to the talk is when people come up to me and they tell me about their children. They say, this is going to help me with my children and my grandchildren. And so I wrote a book called The Freak Factor for Kids that helps people see how this is true for kids and how kids can read it sort of in their own language. And I, uh, a woman came to my conference, a conference where I was speaking, it was over two days, um, and multiple speakers, and she bought a copy of the kid's book, took it home to her son who has ADD. And he read it and he wrote me a note and she brought it to me the next day and it said, thank you Mr. Rendell for the book, it made me feel better about who I am. Um, those are the kinds of things that I want to leave as my legacy. I did a presentation in Australia and a woman had brought her daughter with dyslexia and she came down and I was literally running out the door to make it to the plane to fly to the other side of the world. It was the end of my tour um, and I had to hurry and she said, I just need a moment of your time. She said, my daughter has dyslexia and now we have hope, right? Um, so giving people hope who don't have hope, helping people to see, as I said at the end, that deep inside them something is valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to their touch. If there's people who say, my life was better, it was more fulfilling, it was more meaningful, um, it was more valuable, um, because I discovered who I was and found a way to use that in the world, that's the legacy that I want to leave. And I know it's already happening, and I'm just hoping to do it for as many people and in, in, in as many places as I possibly can. Thank you very much indeed. Thank very you. Real, real pleasure. Yep. Um, or I wish I would have learned it sooner, that my biggest weaknesses were also strengths. The things that people were trying to stop me from doing were the very things that I should be using.